if you met a drunk person who'd been drinking since the morning, that would not be a person that you really would want to talk to, I think. Hey guys, welcome back to the Quarter Cutter Podcast. This week we have a super special guest, Hannah from the Miss Hannah K YouTube channel. As of this recording, she has over 100,000 subscribers and she has been uploading consistently for nearly 10 years. She's from the UK and she has been documenting her progress learning Japanese for the past 10 years. In this podcast, we learned about her story as a whole, which included studying Japanese at Oxford University, studying abroad at Kobe University in Hyogo, and also spending a couple of months working on a working holiday in Japan at a ski resort in Nagano. If you guys like the podcast, please consider subscribing and leaving a comment to let us know what you think. And if you guys want to support us, check out our Patreon. We have lots of bonus clips and perks as well. Hope you guys enjoy the podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Korekara Podcast, where we look into different aspects of Japan with people who know what they're talking about. I'm your host, Raza, and I'm joined by my co-host, Eric. And this week, we have a very special guest in Miss Hanake. Yes, so Hannah is a YouTuber from the UK, and she's been studying Japanese for almost 10 years now. Um, I first came across one of Hannah's old videos speaking Japanese when I first started studying Japanese, and I think that was one of her videos when she first started to, to learn, and it's been really motivating for me to see the tremendous progress that she's made over time. And she primarily makes uh, videos in Japanese, although there are English subtitles on all the videos. So she has a big audience in both Japanese and English. And over the past 10 years or so, she's documented all of her ups and downs on YouTube, not necessarily related to Japanese and studying Japanese, but in today's podcast, we want to get to hear about Hannah's story as a whole. But first for our audience, can you give a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Hi, thank you for having me on. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm from Durham in the United Kingdom in the Northeast. And I've been learning Japanese since I was about 13. Um, so I think like a lot of people as a teenager and as a, I mean, as a child, I was into Japanese anime. Um, I discovered anime because I was really into um, the game Animal Crossing on the DS at the time. Um, and I found out that there was a Japanese anime movie based on Animal Crossing. And that was the first time that I ever heard Japanese. And so I was teaching myself from the age of 13 to 18. And when I was 18, I got into Oxford University and did a degree for four years that included a year living in Kobe in Japan. And then I graduated and took a year off. And then now I'm back again. I'm back in Oxford to do an MPhil degree, a master's degree, also in Japanese studies. I see. So just now you talked about sort of like the kikake for yeah. starting to learn Japanese. But so was it just like after seeing that movie that made you decide to learn Japanese or was there another event? I mean, yeah, I mean, I kind of like people quite often ask me like, did you want to learn Japanese because of the language or because of the anime? And I kind of don't even really know anymore because I don't know that. So that Animal Crossing movie was the first time that I had heard Japanese for an extended period of time. I heard Japanese and been aware of the fact that it was Japanese. And I thought it just sounded really cool. But I also loved like the animation. I loved like the funny faces the characters were making. Like it's just different from, you know, cartoons that I'd seen mm -hmm. on British TV growing up. But I mean, I really loved the sound of it. And I liked, you know, and I, so when I first watched it, I watched it, someone had like filmed the cinema screen and just uploaded the whole thing to YouTube. And so it had no subtitles. Um, and so while I was watching it, I was like trying to guess what they were saying and trying to pick up words as I went along so really my you know it it was the language that mm. excited me most but then you know after that I did start watching more I, I started watching more Japanese anime and did get really into anime for quite a long time but ultimately it was the language that interested me interested me more and I kind of <laughs> stopped watching quite as much anime and focused more on actually trying to learn to speak the language and how did you initially like study Japanese in, in the beginning so I mean at the beginning at the very very beginning basically what I was doing was like googling Japanese phrase books or like lists of Japanese words and printing them out and just like learning them 
and watching anime and if I heard something that I recognized or like I learned some piece of vocabulary from anime writing it down and like adding it to these like lists of words that I had um and you know eventually and and like I, I don't know I feel like people always want me to say like oh I used Duolingo or something like that but there wasn't really like a specific uh like there was never one specific resource that I used I was just like thinking huh I wonder how you say this in Japanese and googling like what is the grammar that you need to say this mm-hmm. certain sentence and just kind of picking up scraps and I was I was using like you know how to learn Japanese websites and stuff but never for I never like committed to one for very long it was just and Let's then see. of course like making YouTube videos uh helped a lot just to like hear myself speaking Japanese and like forcing myself to sit down and try and stumble through you know like 10 minutes of just talking Japanese really helped I think and I guess like um later on as you got better did you go back and watch rewatch like that movie yeah I know like um a lot of people find out that the way that people talk in anime is really different than how people speak oh in yeah definitely life. yeah absolutely and I mean and at the beginning I kind of did want I mean at the beginning when I was so into anime I sort of did want to sound like an anime character like I didn't really care if it mm sounded weird because to me the like you know the anime way of talking was like so cute and interesting but then you know I was also into um like j-pop and I would watch like variety bangumi and stuff like that so I don't know and yeah and I mean it is weird now to go back like I watched that Animal Crossing movie so many times I watched it all the time and like I to the point where the sound sounded really familiar to me and now they still sound familiar and I can remember how they sounded when they were gibberish, but now I know what it means and it's a really strange sensation to be able to go back and actually understand it this time. Wow. And I guess we've talked about how you kind of documented your Japanese journey through your YouTube channel for these past 10 years. And we also mentioned before about you going to Oxford for studying Japanese. So when you actually got into Oxford, did you feel like, you were maybe ahead of your peers in terms of learn, um in terms of studying Japanese. Well, it was in, so so when I started in first year, there were eight of us. It's a really really small department, and so in first year, I was one of oh, wow. eight people in Oxford wow. joining to study Japanese. Um, and it was we were quite a mixed bag. So there were a few people who had never learned any Japanese before and who wanted to you know just study something because uh because oxford you can't you can apply with nothing like as long as you have a good reason for wanting to study it and you have good grades in school you totally can apply and learn japanese from scratch as long as you're prepared to do that because i think it was really tough and like hard work for them and then there were also people who had actually learned japanese at school so there's not many schools in the uk that offer Japanese like as just like a, one of their regular taught classes in their curriculum um but so there were a couple of people who'd learned Japanese at school and there were a couple of people who like me had taught themselves and there was one boy who was half Japanese um and so everyone kind of came in at different levels and so we were split into to absolute beginners and people who knew some Japanese and it was really interesting that like we were good in different ways. So the boy who had, so there was one boy who went to Eton, which I don't know if you've heard of Eton. It's like the fanciest potter's school in the United Kingdom, like a boys' school. And it like all the prime ministers, not all the prime ministers, but a lot of prime ministers went to this school. Um, and he had, he had like learned Japanese in the best school in the country. And he could talk about, you know, really complicated topics. He knew how to speak. He knew how to use keigo. He was great at grammar he actually knew he knew all the grammar points because he'd actually been taught in a classroom but once our teacher um told us a joke that her five-year-old son had made where he was eating soup and he said "Un no soup oishi <laughs> <laughs> and we and me and the guys and me and the boy who was half japanese and the boy who had also taught himself japanese all laughed but the boy who learned it in school he didn't know the word uncle. He didn't know the word for poop because obviously you don't get taught that in school. So we were kind of like an interesting like mix. And I mean, I think the pe- so the people in the beginners class got really, really pushed really hard because the aim was 
at the end of the first year we would all be sort of on the same level um so that we can all go to japan together um but now i mean after the four years you know there are people in that beginners class who are much better than me at kanji and who you know like may- maybe they don't speak quite as like but just because they haven't been speaking it for as long like the speaking maybe is a bit different but like there are some of them who've like worked so hard and they're they're written japanese and their kanji are really really amazing um so i don't think i really was ahead of my peers necessarily because we were just sort of we all had different skills and different things we were good at and like throughout the process was it kind of like a cohort where you guys like went through together yeah definitely like those guys are my best friends in the whole world so um yeah because we all went to Kobe together we lived in the same dormitory went to the same classes every day and like in Kobe you know we were like they were my only friends I had in Japan um oh, wow and like you know we did our final exams together and everything and I and I'm in a group chat with them and I still talk to them every single day about everything that's happening in my life well, <laughs> and I guess what was your personal experience like studying Japanese in a classroom setting because we often hear stories where people just take classes for multiple years or even like sometimes passing um JLPT N1 but still not being able to like hold a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely like it was really helpful for me to be kind of shown what I can't do because you know, I think I was a little bit cocky when I started. Mm-hmm. I was thinking like, oh well, I I can I can speak Japanese. This first year will be easy because I don't know. I don't know. I just I was a bit cocky. But, you know, my kanji is was terrible and it still kind of is um and also there were things like being asked to explain a grammar point i found really difficult because i just sort of like learned japanese in such a wishy-washy way and kind of like picked up some things and it's like well i don't really know why we say that but it just like sounds natural so like things like she would ask why why is this sentence wa and not ga and like all I could really say was like, well, it would sound wrong if it was ga. And so it was a really so actually it was a really cool experience to kind of learn about the grammar way more in in depth. Um, and that actually made me interested in Japanese linguistics because I don't know, I hadn't really thought so hard about, you know, how Japanese actually works and why the grammar is like this and why does it work this way. Mm. Um and so it was really cool to get to actually kind of go in depth like that. And were the classes taught in Japanese or English? They were taught in Japanese. I mean, so all of my language teachers were Japanese women. Um, and, you know, maybe sometimes I'd switch to English if it was like, we just don't get this. Like, if, if it's just like gets to a point where it's like, okay, I just need to explain to you how this works. But most of the time it was just Japanese all the time. I see. And also, like, was it any different um, when you took classes in Japan? Because for, like, me and Rosalind's experience, it was a lot, it was, like, really intensive of, like, three hours of classes per day when we were studying abroad. What was it like for you? Yeah, so, I don't know. I don't want to kind of, I don't want to throw Kobe University under the bus or anything. But it was, <laughs> it was very different. And, like, we we went to Kobe, you know, as the Oxford University students. And so... They have this like special course that's like meant to be intensive language classes just for it's like the Oxford student high intensity class or whatever. And I think other international students can like apply to be part of the class. So there were some other international students in there as well. But the teaching style is so different. It's so much more, you know, based on like, okay, today we're doing this chapter of the textbook or like today we are reading this. And then we're going to discuss it. And like they had such more of like a set curriculum, set like lesson plans and everything. Like it's not that they didn't have lesson plans in Oxford. It was just more kind of personalized. So like some of my one of so one of the best things that I thought about some of my language classes in Oxford was like she would just let us go off topic as long as it was in Japanese. We would just all be chatting in Japanese about, you know, something that was in the news or just like something that happened or like you know just chatting and then she would point out things that were wrong about what we said and write them on the board and then ask us a question using this grammar point or using this word 
And then the next lesson, she would have prepared like an article or a piece of text related to just whatever we were chatting about the previous lesson. And so it was super personalized and like super, I don't know, she made it as interesting as it possibly could be. Whereas in Kobe, it was, you know, today we're going to do this chapter of the textbook. And sometimes it was stuff that we had already done in first year or stuff that just like wasn't interesting. And like there were good teachers and it was good. And I think if I hadn't been completely spoiled by my first year at Oxford, it would have been really good. Um, but I think all of us found it actually quite difficult to adapt to like this different teaching style. Yeah, I feel like Japan, they always go, they're very in it <laughs> with、yeah. the, how strict they are with their plans. Eric and I we were right in the yeah, thick of it. My experience. <laughs> yeah, by the book. Absolutely zero flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I guess going into, I guess,、um, outside the classroom during your study abroad, was it, did you find it easy to make friends with people outside of Oxford? Yeah, I mean, it was hard to make friends within the university because, I mean, again, I don't want to put, it's not Oxford's fault, it's not Kobe's fault. I don't know, it's just how the program works is that you are kind of, you know, the Oxford students when you go there. And so you're kind of isolated from the international students and isolated from the Japanese students. Like it's quite hard to mingle. And I found, like, you know, if I was talking to Japanese students, they would just want to talk to me in English. And, like, and I, I, I did make some really good friends with the international students, but you kind of had to get past this barrier of, like, oh, you're one of the Oxford ones. And I'd be like, yeah, but, but I want to be friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I should be recommending this to people, but I made most of my friends by going out drinking. Alone, which you know, in the UK, I could never ever go out drinking alone as a woman. Like, I could maybe go to a pub and read a book, but I couldn't, you know, go drinking. And so, I used to go into just like small, like Tachinomiya or like little tiny Zakaya and like try and make myself a regular and make、mm-hmm. friends with the bartenders and make friends with the other regulars. And and I made loads of friends that way because you know, these people would introduce me to other people that they brought in the bar. Um, I made some really good friends that way. <laughs> so that is, that's what I tend to, re- to recommend to people. I mean, like, it's a bit daunting to just like, walk into a bar and introduce yourself. But I mean, when you're a foreigner in Japan, you kind of don't really have to introduce yourself because people will just、like, ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you comfortable speaking Japanese at that time, or was there any language barrier? I was pretty comfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've always been more comfortable in a kind of. Colloquial chatty setting. Um, um, and I mean, sometimes, you know, especially if, like, cause, because it's Kobe, it's Kansai Ben. And, like,、right. particularly when it's like drunk old guys who speak <laughs> Kansai Ben, it really was quite a challenge. But I mean, you know, how else was I going to learn Kansai? Because, you know, in, even though we're in Kobe, in our classes, they were teaching us standard Japanese. And so, how, how else am I meant to understand the people around me other than <laughs> go out drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, speaking about drunk old men, did you have like a funny story in a pub where <laughs> there, there was someone really going wild? <laughs>、um, <laughs> during... I think. Well, I remember my pet, so my parents came to visit, and,、uh-huh. my, and so I told them a bar to meet me in. It was one of my favorite bars. And My dad was like so blown away by like Japan and like Japanese. Because in the UK, you do not want to be talking to a random drunk man. Like, but in Japan, <laughs> the random drunk men are so like sweet and polite. I mean, most of the time, there are some like nasty guys. But my dad said there was this guy in there completely obliterated, somehow <laughs> managing to communicate in like broken drunk English and also like interpretation from the bartender who spoke a little bit of English, saying like, I had a job interview this morning and it went really bad. So I've been drinking since 10 a.m. But he was like, <laughs> but and so he, like, he was miserable and drunk, but he was going, Welcome to Japan! And like <laughs> being so like warm and friendly. And like my dad was just like, I can't, like, you know, in the UK, if you met a drunk person who'd been drinking since the morning, who was sad about、um, failing at a job interview, that would not be a person that you <laughs> really would want to talk to, I think. <laughs> Did you find that there were any like cultural differences between people in Kansai and、uh, people in maybe like the Tokyo region? Because I've heard that 
people in Kansai are more open and willing to make friends. But even on the yeah. subway, they they talk more versus uh, in Tokyo. Yeah, I, I mean, I did kind of, I mean, I didn't spend that much time in Tokyo. And so I didn't really have the same kind of experience of like going to a bar and trying to make friends. Um, but I don't know, there is a kind of like, Tokyo is a, just a little bit more business-like, isn't it? It's And I always compare it to, because so I'm from the north in the UK. And it's, I feel like you can quite easily compare Kansai to the north and Tokyo to London. It's the same kind of slight personality difference of like, I don't know, warm friendliness and like just slightly more kind of business like seriousness. <laughs> I see. And I guess like one interesting experience you did have in Japan was you got to go to film a TV show, right? I did. How was that experience like? Yeah, so that was actually, so that was before I went on my year abroad. That So that was literally my first oh. time in Japan. So the summer before I was due to go to Kobe, um, I got contacted by TV Tokyo who said they wanted to do a TV show about a foreign YouTuber going to Japan. And I was like, uh, is this real? But yeah, sure. Okay. And it was quite scary because I literally, you know, they said, I mean, so they, they proved who they were, like it, it was all legit, but they did say, we can't tell you anything about what we're doing because we want it to be like a surprise for you. And he said, all, all we can say is that you'll spend a few days in Tokyo and then we'll take you to Miyazaki and film there for a few days. And I was like, okay. And so I literally, it was my first time flying alone as well. So I flew to Japan, landed in the airport. Like in the airplane, I was like putting on makeup and like washing my face. Like, oh my God, like I've been flying for like 24 hours. I've been traveling for 24 hours and now I'm going to like meet a TV crew. And, you know, walked off the plane and there was a TV crew in the, <laughs> in the arrivals area. <laughs> Um, and it was just completely mad, like an absolutely insane first experience of Japan. Like, I mean, crazy. So, you know, staying in very nice hotels and just being driven around and taken to see lots of nice things. And it, it was very tiring. Like, I wasn't really able to be like, oh, I just want to stay inside today. And like, because I was jet lagged as well. But, you know, we went all around Tokyo like I saw just kind of like Harajuku and like Shibuya and the kind of big like touristy areas um and then we went to Miyazaki and I what did I do I I went to an eel farm and was like grabbing eels with my hands oh yeah and in Miyazaki I was being um guided by an Australian man who called Jamie who is kind of a local tv personality and he's he's lived in Miyazaki for years and years and years and speaks like Miyazaki dialect when he speaks Japanese oh, wow. um and you know he he really knew he knew what he was doing because he was actually a tv person and so I was just there walking along like I saw this in there wow I saw this in there like not really <laughs> like <laughs> it was a bit daunting um but it was so much fun it was just crazy <laughs> I've heard some stories of how like a lot of Japanese tv is usually scripted even when they try to make like shows that are unscripted like Terrace House did mm -hmm. you experience anything like that where they were like, no, like, oh, well, react this way? They, oh. they wouldn't even tell me what we were doing. So, because it was all supposed <laughs> to be like a surprise for me and my natural reaction, um, which did mean that sometimes I wouldn't even understand, because, you know, I wouldn't understand what was going on. Because, like, I feel there was something where they were like, surprise, we're going to a new Nagi farm. And I kind of didn't really know what they were saying. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean they must have like cut those bits but there were definitely some bits where like I just kind of didn't really know what was going on and and actually you if you watch it and you count the number of times that I say Sigoi or I saw this car like I just say these same like little phrases <laughs> over and over again <laughs> and I guess after actually experiencing that do you ever think about maybe doing something on Japanese TV in the future I mean maybe I mean I don't know. I've heard terrible things about working in Japanese TV. And I mean, and also I do get the feeling that whenever you have a kind of foreign person on Japanese TV, it's the same kind of narrative, isn't it? Of like, wow, I was so yeah. surprised at this thing in Japan. It was amazing. And I've quite often, you know, in Japan, in, in Tokyo and in Osaka, you quite often do get stopped on the street by um, TV crews who are just like looking for white people to interview, basically. <laughs> and like... <laughs> 
they'll be like oh have you been surprised by something in japan and i'm like well not really because i've been studying japan japan and japanese culture for like 10 years and they were like oh but surely you have something i remember once this guy interviewed me and he was clearly so exasperated by the fact that i just had like nothing interesting to say that he showed me his list that his like boss had given him of like things that foreigners might have done that might be funny and he was like have you done any of these <laughs> and, and like one of them was like eating burning your mouth on takoyaki and i was like well i guess i've done that but like every should everyone yeah. ev- everyone who's eaten <laughs> yeah. takoyaki more than a handful of times has burned their mouth on takoyaki and so i, d- I don't think they ever broadcast me because i think i was just <laughs> quite boring <laughs> one thing i've noticed when i watch some of those tv shows with foreigners like you and Anishi like mm-hmm. whenever sometimes when they interview a foreigner they do like um fukikai so like um, they overdub it with like a Japanese person yeah but then like the way that they're speaking is like nothing like how they're actually yeah. speaking at all and sometimes it's like just different content as well mm-hmm. yeah I've been interviewed by them as well but they also didn't use that <laughs> 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 they stopped by every TV crew out here yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I guess going back to Kobe now, so with that as like a pretty interesting first experience into Japan, did it kind of set expectations going into Kobe where you had like all this luxurious stuff and now you're going in as a study abroad student? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I wasn't expecting all the luxuriousness that I experienced on the TV show, but I mean, Kobe was really proper student life. Like I, we stayed in these tiny little uh student dorm rooms um and i don't know i mean but it was wonderful though i loved it i had a brilliant time in kobe like there were obviously some hard times like it's um, it's always hard moving to a foreign country for the first time um but no i loved it i think it was really good i see what, what would you say the number one most difficult thing moving to japan for the study abroad was for you well, I think really, I think my main, pro- I think my problem wasn't that it was Japan. It was just me being a 19 year old living alone um, because so in Oxford, um, in in the like student accommodation in Oxford, you have like a lady who comes and who was your room and who takes your bins out and stuff. And I ate in the dining hall. And so I wasn't cooking. I wasn't cleaning. I was just like sleeping, partying working um but suddenly in Kobe you know I have bills that I have to pay somehow I have to like go to the bank and pay these bills I have to clean my own room I have to somehow cook for myself and feed myself and it's all in Japanese and I don't have many friends like and so it was just kind of you know I think that if I had moved to Japan and uh, and you know I had like people to do stuff for me it sounds so terrible <laughs> then like it wouldn't have been so bad it was, just, it's, it was just the combination it really was just a combination of being in a different country and also being like a spoiled little 19 year old who doesn't know how to look after myself just trying to like figure out how to be an adult human being and so really my main problem was just like I would get miserable because my room was dirty and all I'd eaten was like pizza and spaghetti um <laughs> and like yeah so I, I mean that was my main problem like I so I uploaded a video called like oh it's hard to get used to Japan and like the thumbnail was like me looking sad um and like some people were really quite angry at that video because like obviously it's a clickbaity thumbnail but really what I meant was like I didn't mean it's difficult to get used to Japan I mean it's difficult to get used to my new life and like actually living alone and being self-sufficient for the first time I see and I guess, like, going into Kobe, though, one thing that everyone knows and loves about Kobe is the beef. So <laughs> do you actually have, <laughs> do you have a story about actually getting to have that? I did have it one, once or twice. There was, like, one really nice restaurant that did, like, like, I think, I think I knew from the beginning that it wasn't really worth going to one of the, like, Kobe beef restaurants because they were clearly like tourist traps. I mean, I don't know if they were tourist traps, but they were clearly like aimed at tourists. But I, uh-huh. I did go to this nice restaurant that had like all local Hyogo prefecture ingredients. And so like it had really nice onions because Awaji, um, Awaji Island is really famous for its onions. And it had like all these kind of local vegetables and like local pork and stuff. But it also had Kobe beef. And you could get like a little mini teppanyaki of like 
six like coin sized pieces of Kobe beef for like uh for like 1200 yen which I thought wasn't too bad really for the experience of it um and it's nice I mean it's very very rich and I don't think I would want more than like these little coin like I don't think I could imagine eating a whole steak of Kobe beef because it's so rich and fatty that like you kind of do just want like a little piece in your mouth like a little like a little I don't know it's like a candy or something (laughs) it just (laughs) melts (laughs) <laughs> that's making me hungry already <laughs> and i guess like how would you compare going and studying abroad to japan to actually like traveling there by yourself yeah um so so during my year abroad i did do some like solo traveling and I mean, I think Japan is probably one of the few countries in the world that as like a young woman, you can travel alone and be relatively safe. Like, you I mean, you're obviously never a hundred percent safe, but I felt way more at ease traveling alone in Japan than I would do in the UK. Um, and that was really cool because I just was like, one day I was like, well, I'm just gonna leave Kobe and go somewhere and we'll just see. And so I was just like getting random buses and random trains. And then uh, depending on where I was at like 5 p.m., then I would just like look for a hotel wherever I was. And that was really, really cool and really fun. And I did mad things like I hung out with all these fishermen because I was getting a ferry from (laughs) the bottom of Shikoku to the top of Kyushu. And so I was just in this like random little oh, fishing wow. town because I just Googled like, where can I get a boat across? Um, and I went and bought a boat ticket that left at half past midnight and arrived at 3 a.m. on the other side. And I was like, well, that's quite good because I don't need to stay anywhere tonight. <laughs> and then I just like was like look, walking around on the dock and was like, hi, do you know where I can just like get a drink and some food? And then they like pointed at this little bar and I went to this little bar that was ran by this lady who gave me oysters raw oysters for free because it was like wow there's a foreigner here have these oysters and i i I somehow managed to eat like i couldn't exactly like refuse them so i managed to eat these oysters and there was this fisherman there and he was like i'm gonna go to this other bar with all my fisherman friends do you want to come and i was like yeah sure why not (laughs) and so i went to this bar that was just like i don't know full of fishermen um and it had like the like dried fugu fish hanging from the ceiling And it was ran by this woman who must have been in her 80s who was absolutely hammered. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And she was so funny and she was so sweet. Um, And like all these fishermen were like taking photos with me. And then she like rang her son to come and like see that there was a foreigner in the bar. Um, And then all the fishermen like were like, we're going to karaoke. Do you want to come? And I was like, oh, I can't. I have to get my boat at half past 12. And so all the fishermen left and I was the only person in the bar um and she was just like oh don't worry I'll wait for you wait with you until your um boat and she showed me that like since like in her old age she had started learning English using like uh the like special English section of the newspaper every day it was so cute and it's just like so much fun having experiences like that just going and like talking to random people and like making friends who are your friends for literally one night and then you never see them again (laughs) <laughs> what an adventure <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i got the boat at half past midnight and arrived at the top of kyushu at like 3 a.m and i was greeted by this little orange cat that was just hanging out on the docks and like it, he was so friendly so i guess that probably like like fisherman cats must be pretty like nice to humans because they probably get fish off the fishermen Um, And I had nothing else better to do because, like, it was ages until the first train. Like, my plan was to get the first train because I wanted to get to Miyazaki that day. Um, And I was like, well, I've got nothing else better to do. So I was just, like, following this cat around all these alleyways. (laughs) 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 Just, like, seeing what it was up to. And that was quite fun. That was quite, like, a romantic, like, I don't know, like, uh, (laughs) Miyazaki-esque experience. I think I saw an anime movie. Yeah. Like a cat leaving (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was the start of a movie right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I mean, and 
I, I was w were you able to kind of improve your Japanese through these kind of random encounters you kind of went through your journey through Japan by yourself and like interacting with all these different people I mean yeah definitely because you know talking to different kinds of people you get to hear different kinds of Japanese so you know some of those fishermen were completely unintelligible to me um <laughs> and like the old lady <laughs> as well she was so drunk and so old like it's hard it's hard to talk to well i mean basically that's the lesson i've learned is it's difficult to talk to drunk old people that's like the number one challenge of language learning <laughs> um but i mean i talk to young people as well and i talk to people from different prefectures with different accents people of different ages different you know uh lifestyles but yeah i think i mean yeah i i would recommend talking to as many different kinds of people as you can like you're only going to learn a certain kind of japanese if you only talk to your teachers did you try speaking in uh Kansai Ben, or did you mostly stick to like Belgian <laughs> No, I didn't. I mean, I think the prop the well, I don't know. The problem was it's just that I felt like I already had my kind of voice in Japanese by the time I got to Kobe, and so it felt like I would be putting on an accent or like pretending to be someone else if I suddenly suddenly started mm -hmm. trying to speak Kansai Ben. But I'm I'm quite jealous of it. So the ones who uh, had been learning Japanese from scratch, some of them going to Kobe was their first time in Japan. And so they were really able to pick up the accent. And, you know, I have senpais who, you know, graduated and then went back to Kansai and fully, fully Kansai Ben. And I am a little bit envious of that. But I, I don't know, I felt I didn't feel able to kind of switch over so easily. I see. And I guess, like, throughout your time in Kobe, what would you say your number one study abroad experience was out of all that time? Oh, my gosh. Um, there's so many. I went to Okinawa as my end of year trip with my friends, and like oh, wow. that was bad because just like the the creatures and the wildlife and like it felt it felt like going to a, I mean it kind of well I guess it is like going to a different country, but like not so much in terms of the cult well may, uh, well in terms of culture as well but like just like the the the, the creatures <laughs> in the uk we've got nothing dangerous like there's no dangerous animals here and so we were being really stupid just like this group of british kids swimming in the sea on bits that weren't designated beaches and i swam oh actually no we walked out on this like rock on these rocks that were going out and just like with bare feet and like walking these rock pools and obviously there's like dangerous things and like snappy things and pointless things in there like I can't believe we were so stupid and like we, we walked to the end of these rocks and my feet hurt so I was like well I'll swim back and so got back in and I'm not a very strong swimmer so I was like swimming like next to the edge of the rocks and just like swimming along with my like rubber ring <laughs> trying to get to the uh -huh. other side and then I was just like swimming along and I looked down and I saw these two long black and white stripy things crossed over each other I was kind of like, oh, that's two very large sea snakes. Okay, I'll just keep going, keep going. <laughs> and then afterwards, oh, wow. I like, looked up, like, Okinawa stripy sea snake. And they're, like, the most dangerous, poisonous, terrible snakes that exist, like, in the world. Like, have you ever seen, there was a documentary a while ago about these, like, old women in Okinawa who um, are the last women who can, who who know how to hunt for these snakes and how to catch them, and they have a kind of ceremony where they eat a, they drink a soup made of this snake um and it was that snake and so that was pretty scary <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, i mean that was that was my most stupid like irresponsible um <laughs> year abroad experience well, i guess it's true <laughs> that you didn't know that they were that dangerous or else you might yeah. have panicked I mean, yeah, I mean, I knew that I shouldn't. I was just kind of like, oh, okay, that's a snake. I'm going to try not to, like, touch it with my foot. <laughs> mm. Yeah, like, when I, whenever I think about Okinawa, like, uh, of course you think about the beaches, but I always hear about um, the pit vipers, and that always scares mm. me because I'm not much of a snake person. I mm. never want to be that guy that just walks into a random bush and there's just, like, a, a pit viper right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think snakes aren't even in my consciousness because because there aren't i mean i think there are like in some bits of the uk there are tiny little green garden snakes but there the snakes just aren't something that i've ever had to worry about in my day-to-day -day life <laughs> and so and so i don't think i had like the proper like panic reaction i was just like oh it's a snake swim swim <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think most people would be afraid of snakes in the water, though. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, personally, all those uh, National Geographics, they really got me. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of being scared <laughs> of snakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. But I guess, like, after you came back from your, your abroad, did you experience any sort of, like, uh, reverse cultural shock? Uh, a bit, yeah, because, I don't know, I, in Kobe, if I was bored at 11 p.m., I would just go out and I would walk around or I would go to a bar or, like, I would knock on my friend's doors and, like, there would just be something to do. But, like, at home, like, well, because, so, I mean, immediately after Kobe, I went back home uh, to my parents' house for the summer. And it's just like, oh, like, if I'm bored at 11 p.m., like, I can't just, like, leave and go somewhere. Like, I have to entertain myself in the house. Um, and, yeah, and I missed the food and I missed the people. Um, but I think by the end of my year abroad, I was pretty, like, excited to go home. And it was nice to be home afterwards. I see. And once you got back home, you actually did a dissertation on yeah. something big about Japan, right? And this is actually a really big <laughs> issue that is not often talked about too much, right? When you are actually in the country. Yeah, so so in my third and fourth so I really wrote I wrote the dissertation in my fourth year, but in my third year I got really into Japanese linguistics and particularly sociolinguistics. So um why do these kind of Japanese people speak in this way and these kind of Japanese people speak in this way? And so one of the texts I was reading as part of my like linguistic variation module that I was doing was um, by was by an author called Abe Hideko and it was about um, women's language and about why different women speak in different ways and particularly about first person pronouns. So why do some young girls choose to use boku and ore rather than watashi or atashi? And why do some lesbians choose to use ore or boku or jibun or other kind of, you know, first person pronouns that are not traditionally associated with femininity or like softness or whatever you want to, however you want to define it. And so through that, I was, I mean, I always wanted to write something about, um, internet Japanese because so much of my Japanese I learned through the internet I was really interested in like how how do we you know how do different people use Japanese on the internet to convey their own identity and I got really interested in one kotoba which is a kind of Japanese used by gay men some gay men not all gay men um, particularly kind of I don't know it's kind of associated with flamboyancy and like effemininity um and it's kind of a point of contention of whether or near is it is it different to women's language are, are these gay men using women's language or is it something else entirely and i mean i think it's something else entirely because so basically my my, my thesis was like i don't think that um that there's any point in trying to categorize different languages like men's language and women's language because you're not indexing your gender you're indexing some other part of you which is what makes up whatever your gender is if that makes sense so when I use watashi I'm kind of expressing you know watashi is associated with like softness gentleness which happens to also be associated with femininity so when I use watashi I'm not using watashi because I'm a woman it's just one of the things that adds up to the fact that I am a woman, if that makes sense. And so uh, what I was researching was how gay men on the anonymous forum Five Channel, used to be Two Channel, now it's Five Channel. Um, on, so there's like a gay board on there called the, the Dorsei Salon, um, which I was snooping, I was lurking on, reading, um, <laughs> analysing their use of language. Because my theory was that if you can't, if people can't see you and you're only communicating using text and you want to express the fact that you are gay, 
you're more likely to use more of these kind of language markers that point out things like femininity, softness, like these characteristics that are associated with this gay identity. And so I compared how often people on this forum were using these language markers to how um, gay men who who you can see use or near quarter in day-to-day life, how often they use these markers in their day-to-day speech in real life. So what sort of um, like specific traits do they have? They can identify them as um, like men who are trying to be more feminine. So, um, so quite commonly they might use atashi as their first person personal pronoun, which is kind of more kind of girly light than watashi. Um, so would they, they might... just write that in like hiragana on online? Quite often because, in like, katakana. Because they use the same kanji. Yeah, yeah, quite often in, in hiragana or in katakana. Um, you know, ending a sentence in wayo or like nano and nano yo and all these combinations of these and dropping <laughs> dropping da. So rather than saying kire da yo, you'd be like kire yo or like kire wa yo, kire, you know. Um, uh-huh. and, and I mean, and you do find real women using constructions like these, but you can't say that all women use them all the time. Like you can't say that that is women's language because it's just not in reality. It's just not how all women speak. Um, and at the same time, you know, all near quarterback is difficult to define because, you know, not all of these men use it all the time. Um, and I mean, I, and there's, you know, there are examples of people who are not gay men using this sort of language, but they use it for different reasons to, you know, express some kind of femininity or softness. Um, but it is kind of like an exaggeration. Like it's a, it's different from women's language. I see. And how if there how is such the... a thing as women's language. If there is such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> And how long did the entire research portion of your dissertation take? So I spent, so let's think, I I think it was about December when I decided what I wanted my topic to be. And then I finished my dissertation in March or April. Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of reading. And I interviewed some gay Japanese YouTubers called uh, Second Street. And they were very sweet. And like, I just like asked them loads of questions about like, what do you think on Nae Kotoba is? Like, why, why do you talk like this sort of thing? And they were so, they were so kind and like answered all my annoying questions. And um, yeah, and a lot of just trawling these forums, finding interesting examples, funny examples. Um, yeah, and yeah, I was really. I had one example that had the word um, debusen, like fat, fat fetish, in it, and I just felt so proud that I got my um, dissertation supervisor to say the words fat fetish out loud when I presented him with this, <laughs> oh, this example. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what would you say after that entire journey with your dissertation and interviewing these Japanese YouTubers? What would you say your main takeaway after that was? just that like gender is mad like gender is confusing and like you can wrap yourself into such like a tangle when you start trying to talk about gender and language and sexuality and language and like what even is sexuality what even is gender and like why you know why why do they even have anything to do with each other and you know and yeah it just made me think like I need to read more books (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I think that's a sign of quite, quite I think that is a good sign to finish a dissertation and feel like oh, I need I want to read more I want to find out more which is why I'm back here again to do some more research do you feel like um those sorts of conversations or thoughts are happening enough in Japan because I know Japan's still like really heavy on a lot of gender roles um and a lot of like English-speaking countries are trying to break down sort of these like traditional gender roles yeah I mean I don't know. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I can't really talk for, you know, 
what people are talking about in Japan on such like a grand scale and like I haven't I'm not totally up to date on you know what sort of research is going on in terms of gender and sexuality like in an academic sense but I did find like so so this past uh winter I was working on a ski resort and so I was hanging out with loads of young people and when I casually mentioned to them that I have a girlfriend um it it wasn't a problem like it was chill whereas I feel like when I used to you know try try to casually drop it into a conversation with older people it's more of a conversation like I have to have a conversation about it afterwards so um, that makes me think that you know attitudes are changing and I think there is like a vibrant queer community in Japan um but I think it's still hard like you know I don't think I would want to be a gay teenager in Japan necessarily I mean obviously all the situations are different some people must have wonderful accepting families um but I would rather be a gay teenager in the UK than a gay teenager in Japan I think I see and I guess going and speaking to your ski resort job though kind of transitioning in because that was a really great experience you got to have while you with the working holiday that you got to take right after graduating from oxford the um for your undergrad right Mm -hmm. so how, how did that kind of materialize how did you end up getting that ski resort job and how did how was the entire experience like yeah so so actually like the summer between my third year and fourth year i had found this company boo boo ski um and I had rang them about so they also so they also offer like beach resort jobs and I wanted I really wanted to go back to Japan or go to you know just Asia or like however I wanted to go somewhere over the summer uh-huh. between my third and fourth year and so like I I got in touch with them to see if I could do a beach resort job over the summer um and then I never heard back from them I like did an interview with them and then never heard back from them and so instead I organized like a, a summer school in Korea that I went and did which was cool um and then I got this email being like oh my god I'm so sorry we just like lost your application <laughs> <laughs> and so if you ever want to work with us you can pick where you go because normally they randomly assign you and I was like okay thank you I'll keep that in mind and then you know it was getting close to graduation and uh, in my fourth year and everyone was like talking about what like the only conversation I was having was so what do you think you're going to do after graduation and I was just like oh, I just need something and I was like well I can go work on a ski resort for a few months seeing as I've got this opportunity where I can just like pick a job basically which was quite nice and so I sent the booby ski guy an email being like hi yeah I'd quite like to work at Nozawa Onsen ski resort um, what jobs do you have available there and he said you can work on a ski lift you can work in the rental shop or you can work at the information desk and I was like well information desk sounds lovely and so that's what I did um and it was really cool it was a totally different experience from being in Japan as a student I didn't travel at all because I was just in this ski resort town the whole time um Mm. so busy working like I didn't have that many days off I had like six days off a month but I got to go skiing on those days off so it was pretty good I had a really good time it was really like I I got so healthy over those few months and like it was my first I don't know it was like just like being somewhere cold and having to wake up every morning and walk up a mountain and then like on my day off the only thing that there is to do is ski and I was eating like um they had like a canteens where they had like they they made my bento box every morning for me to take to work and so I was eating really healthily and I just like felt great. Like I felt so much better mentally and physically over those few months. So now that I'm like living alone again, I'm trying to like recreate my not our life <laughs> as much like How that. many hours were you working at that place? Um, it depended at like what point in the season it was because when it got busy, I'd have to work longer. And then sometimes I had to work overtime if I was like interpreting. Um, but usually I had to be there by eight and I would leave at like quarter past five. I think it was my like usual day. So like the interpreting part was kind of separate for based off of um, special occasions. Yeah. Well, it was just kind of, you know, one of my 
many hats that I ended up wearing because, you know, I was there as the kind of information desk lady where if you've got a question, you can come ask me. But I was also running a little gift shop and I was helping with the lost and found. And I was doing the English announcements like, hi, uh, we found your child. Come get them sort of thing. Um, And what else was I doing? And I was like translating signs sometimes. And like into if someone was like if there was a lost English speaking kid, I would interpret or like when there were people who were injured, I would interpret with the um, ski patrol, like first aid team. And so I was just doing a lot of different stuff every day, which meant that sometimes I was really, really busy. But also it meant that, you know, it did get really quiet, towards, especially when coronavirus kicked off. It got really quiet towards the end. And it was a lot of just kind of sitting at my desk waiting for someone to come and ask me a question. So in those times, I was grateful that I had a lot of different things that I could be doing. Um, But yeah, so sometimes, you know, it just if there was an occasion where like there was this one time where like this guy had skied off piste and he was stuck like in a river um, in some random like deep bit of the mountain in uh, the trees. And so I was with his friends that he'd come with and like interpreting with the ski patrol team and like they were trying to like work out his position and everything and that was a bit scary but I mean I, I apparently he oh actually no I remember I saw him because I did night skiing that night which is another cool thing that I got to do working there was like sometimes after a day of work I would go night skiing and I saw him uh going into the office absolutely caked in snow and I heard a rumor and it was by then it was like 9 p.m or something no not that late 8 p.m and I heard a rumor that he was like up to his neck in the snow by that point because he had just been like stuck uh, next to this river because his ski had fallen in the river. <laughs> wow. I've, I've never heard anything happen like that for someone. So that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a time to be there. Yeah. I'm glad the guy was all okay. Yeah, he wow. was all right. Yeah. And I mean, working at an information desk, you had to talk to a lot of people, right? Yeah. And both english japanese like you're saying for maybe tourists or people who needed to translate but in in terms of japanese were you well this is kind of like the next level you're able to take after all the time previous in japan yeah it was definitely pushing me to my limits which was really really good for my japanese and my you know my first time working in japan i mean actually it was my first proper job full stop um, and it was my first time using, you know, Japanese in the workplace and having to use Kegel with customers and things like that and have like senpai as and a boss and everything. Um, and yeah, it really did push me to my limits, but um, but I managed, I guess. <laughs> there were a few yeah. embarrassing times where I would mess up my Kegel, but but I don't know, customers seemed to be fairly understanding. It wasn't too bad. Was your, uh, was your boss like strict at all? No, actually, he was lovely. Um, yeah, no, I think actually, in I think in terms of working in Japan, it was a pretty lenient job. Like I was able to take sick days if I needed a sick day without any, you know, issue. Um, if I, I, I definitely felt like if I didn't understand something, I could just ask. If I needed help something, I could just ask. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't get the you know the stereotypical sense of like the scary Japanese workplace but I think a ski resort is generally quite a laid-back chill environment I don't know <laughs> but was it mostly a Japanese environment or was it oh, yeah, yeah. English yeah all of the I mean so there were other English speakers working there um a lot of Australians most of the ski instructors were Australians um I had, an, I mean, a huge amount number of the tourists were Australians. Like it was just like Australians everywhere. Um, um, but my co-workers were mostly Japanese. There were a few uh, Chinese or Taiwanese people there who were like working on the, like there was like a little kids park that had the like same office as me. So their job was just like to make sure the kids didn't fall over on the like tiny baby ski lift and stuff like that. Um, but so, I mean, in, at work, I was talking Japanese all day with my coworkers. I wasn't really switching to English apart from this, um, Filipino girl who used to come and work with me sometimes who spoke perfect American English and perfect Japanese. 
Um, and but then with her, it felt like we would just like slip into this weird like half Japanese, half English mode because we would both be like in Japanese mode from talking Japanese all day, but aware that each other understands English. And so it would just be like, if I couldn't think of a word in Japanese, I would put it in English. And if I couldn't think of a word in English, just like in that moment, I would just put it in Japanese. And then we would talk to each other and just be like, I'm so con- like my brain would hurt <laughs> if we talked like That's that for how, too like, long. How Japanese people talk though. Yeah, I mean it's fun. It's a fun a fun exercise. But we, I did quite often have to be like, wait, stop, stop, stop. Let's just pick a language. <laughs> it's my brain hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it's like end of the day, you got that like one last brain cell hanging yeah. in there. Like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> w- would you say that? Would you say immersion played a good part in kind of improving your Japanese when you were in Japan? Like not only while you're working there but like also when you're studying abroad i mean yeah definitely i think i wasn't as immersed in kobe as i was in nozawa because in kobe you know i would go back to my little dorm room alone and like a lot of the people that i would hang out with would be my classmates who are english speakers um Mm -hmm. whereas in nozawa i had like so at the beginning i had two roommates one who was japanese one who is british And, like, I would actually still be interpreting when I got home to my dorm because uh, the British girl didn't speak that much Japanese. And then, I don't know, roommates kept getting swapped around. I had, at one point, I had a different, just, like, Japanese roommate. And then I had a room to myself at the end. But it was, like, you know, even at the end of the day when you come home, you still have to be in Japanese mode. And, like, having dinner with the other girls in the dorm, because that British girl who's my roommate was the only native english speaker in my dorm like all of the other english speakers i knew were in the boys dorm um and yeah so it, yeah it really was immersion because no matter what i was doing there was just like japanese all around me <laughs> <laughs> and i get i'm i'm sure like your speaking improved the most cuz you're just speaking it all day but how would you say like your um writing or reading has improved during that time i don't know about my writing like the most writing that i did was like uh taking notes when I was on the phone but my notes would end up sort of also being this weird mix of Japanese and English like just like you know trying to hear Japanese and write down what I'm hearing was just like not really working um but my reading improved because on on the days when it was completely quiet and I wasn't doing anything I would just sit there reading um and then also while I was in Nozawa is when I found out that I had gotten into Oxford so I kind of started I was like well I may as well start studying now while I've not got much to do so I was doing like some I don't know translation and stuff just while I was sitting waiting for customers (laughs) I see and would you ever think about maybe pursuing like a similar program such as this in the future or maybe because when people go to want to work in Japan, there's usually that whole stigma of, oh, English teaching, and that's it, when many yeah. people want to kind of be working in a Japanese environment. So I guess you had a really unique aspect in that sense, but would you want to do something similar ever, or maybe even in like a Japanese company, like maybe like city? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would love to live in Japan again, and I would love to, you know, have different experiences working in different kinds of places. I don't know if I would, I wouldn't probably wouldn't want to do the exact same kind of working at a ski resort thing again, but uh-huh. um, I gained so much experience and like, it made me realize like, Oh, I can kind of do interpretation. Like I thought that that wasn't a skill that I had, but then I just sort of got thrown in the deep end and it was like, Oh, I can do this. And you know, I mean my, so my job title was just like information desk lady but I was doing all of these different things, which made me think that like, well, they should just, <laughs> they should hire me <laughs> as something else. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was fun. It was fun to live in a, a ski resort town and to work on a ski resort because I love skiing. Um, and Nozawa Onsen was like the perfect, you know, I think places like Niseko are basically just like a little mini Australia because everyone who works there, everyone who skis there is Australian. And it doesn't really have like a little town of its own. Like everything is just to do with the ski resort. Whereas Nozawa Onsen is like a historical onsen town. And there are locals there who have nothing to do with the ski resort. And like, let's just like, it's got its own little Japanese life going on. So it had like a decent amount of, you know, 
culture as well as just a ski resort. So I'd love to go to Nozawa, Nozawa again, but maybe not to work next time. Would you have I wanted see. to do that job a bit longer? I know you had to like come back a bit yeah. earlier because of the virus, but even on the yeah. original timeline, would you have wanted to do it yeah, longer? Yeah, so I, di- I did manage to reach the end of my contract. And actually, by the time it was the end of March, there really wasn't much snow left. Um, but I think it was like the warmest winter they've had for like 60 years or something. So, I mean, if there was snow for longer... I would have wanted to stay for longer, but I mean, and actually it would be quite interesting to see what Nozawa Onsen looks like in the summer because I hear it's actually really nice in the summer as well and in the springtime to do like hiking and stuff if that's what you're into. Um, And yeah, I I did want to stay in Japan for longer. I had planned to go back to Kobe and hang out in Kobe for a month or two and like find, I don't know what I was going to do there. I was just going to like find something to do. But then coronavirus happened, so... (laughs) So I bailed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you mentioned before that when you studied abroad in Kobe, it was kind of like your first ex- real experience kind of away from home, like actually really getting into the adult life. And yeah. then you had your first real job also in Japan. So yeah. kind of h- how would you say you kind of like grew kind of like as like a person throughout your journey in Japan through these both these times? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've grown so much. I feel like, I mean, I'm still a baby, really. Like, I do I do quite often just think, like, oh, I'm just, like, there's so much stuff that I'm still so clueless about. But I feel like at least now I kind of can function as a human being in grown-up society <laughs> slightly. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I did grow up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking to the future now, like you mentioned, you got into Oxford when you were um, working, and now yeah. you are. It's it's um as of as of the recording, it's going to be tomorrow when it's about to come off to an official start, right? Yeah. So, how how is that looking for you? Do you have a specific goal with your masters that you're going to pursue for these next couple of years? So, well, I want to. I want to improve my Japanese even further because I've hit a wall, I think, where, like, I don't know how to teach myself further. Um, And so I want to be back in the classroom. I want to get told off by my teachers. I want to, like, I want some, like, structure to my studies. And I want to do more research in, like, Japanese linguistics, internet linguistics, queer linguistics, all that sort of stuff. Um... But I also want to kind of, I mean, uh, get better at like real linguistics because I think that's, I mean, at the moment, I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. I don't know if I'll be an academic, but right now what I'm interested in is linguistics. And so I'm going to act as though I am going to be an academic because that will make me better at my master's degree for now. Um, so I want to kind of get a broader understanding of linguistics as a subject because I've only ever studied it from the perspective of Japanese. So I just want to read more and just like, I don't know, fill my brain with knowledge. <laughs> do you think that you would want to do a similar area of research for your dissertation this time? I think so. I don't quite know what I want to do yet, but um, yeah. I still want to do something to do with internet linguistics and socio, like, you know, it's just something where it's like, why do this group of people use this language on the internet in the way they do type of thing. And, and does like the master's program give you like a lot of flexibility to pursue like your interests in linguistics and kind of go your own direction? I think, I mean, I'm going to be busy, but um, so I take, I get to take a few different options. So I think I'm going to take a like classical set text option where we do, because I did classical Japanese language in my undergrad. It's just kind of a bit more of that, reading some Tale of Genji and some pillow book. I'm going to do this option called Boku wa Unagida, which is um, reading a Japanese linguistics book called Boku wa Unagida, which is kind of about wa, and it's about da. And like, what are these little words doing? And it just goes really in depth on just like this 
construction of boku wa unagida. Because when you say boku wa unagida, it doesn't have to mean I am an eel. If you get asked, what are you going to order at the restaurant? You can mm, say boku wa unagida. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order the unagi. But so then it's like, what is the wa doing and what's the da doing? So I'm going to do that and do more kind of broader Japanese linguistics and then do my dissertation, which is twice as long as my undergrad dissertation this time. So that will be quite an undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> Fun step ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess like with um, like earlier you're talking about how you're just going to assume that you might go into academics like after this but in that case would you still want to move to Japan um, permanently at some point I don't know I don't I don't think I do want to move to Japan permanently I think I would love to live there for another few years either all at once or spread out like I think in my my, my ideal vision of my future life would involve kind of going back and forth. I know that's not feasible for, well, I don't know, maybe it's feasible. Um, but I don't know. I've sort of like left, I've still left my future pretty open. Like I don't really know what I want to do. But now that I'm in this master's course, I've got two years to think about it. So that's should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and around last year, you had made some videos for your goals about Japanese, right? Where you kind of yeah. talked about reading more, getting better at business keigo, and kind of keeping a diary. Have you <laughs> kind of kept up with these? and Or have your goals changed at all from then? Well, the diary didn't work out. I don't even have it with... I didn't even bring it with me when I moved. <laughs> <laughs> so the diary didn't work out because, you know, it's such a... Like, I can't even keep a diary in English. Like, I don't have that kind of discipline of like doing the same thing every day um but I still just feel like I want like this I, I just want I just want to be better at Japanese like it just like frustrates me um because I want to be able to like read a book without stopping without thinking about it like I want I just want to be able to read and enjoy the book for its for being a book rather than having to you know, stop and think all the time. I mean, and obviously there are difficult books, there are easy books. Um, but I do want to improve my reading and I want to improve my writing. Like I would love to at some point be able to write something eloquent and nice that people would want to read in Japanese. Like I don't know what, but like I, I want that to be a skill that I have. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to get over this like frustration of being like, I want to be better. Like, why can't I read this? Why can't I do that? Because, you know, a f like a few years ago, my goal in life was like, uh, when I can read a newspaper in Japanese, that's that's it. That's when I'm ready. Yeah. That's when I've done it. And then now I can like kind of read a newspaper in Japanese. It's, I mean, it's, it's a bit, it's quite a lot of effort. And I might have to use a dictionary occasionally. But I can kind of read a newspaper in Japanese. But I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm fluent. I don't yeah. feel like that means that I... I'm done. I don't think I'll ever be done. Yeah, I think with like language learning or even like any skill, it's like a moving goalpost. As soon as you get yeah. there, like your goals have changed so much. Yeah, definitely. Um, even like people I've seen who they've already reached like pretty much a native level. Like, um, I don't know if you know like Peter Barakan, but I think he's from the UK originally and he has like a show like Japanology uh -huh. or something. But he's like lived in Japan for many decades. He's written books in Japanese, but he still has like that sort of like um, like humbleness about his like own Japanese when we mm. asked about it but um I guess along the lines of like Japanese goals um do you have any uh, specific ones maybe like related to some tests like I don't know if you've ever taken like the JLPT but I know there's also like other sorts of tests yeah actually yeah so I've, I've I'm, I'm done with JLPT which is quite nice um but I yeah, I'm interested in the kanji kente. Uh, my kanji has always been a weak point of mine. I would love to just like feel like I actually can do kanji. Um, I feel like kanji kente would be quite a fun thing to work up to. So maybe, maybe one day. Yeah. I mean, I think right now I just want to... Japanese wanna... people struggle with that, I think. Yeah. Like the kante one. I could do like the baby one, maybe. <laughs> 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 the like shogakse level. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any goals to learn other languages? Because I know like in some of your videos you've talked about, I think you took some other language courses in Kobe. And I think I, I, I saw a video where you were taking like a Korean class. 
Yeah, so so I did, so in secondary school, in high school, I studied French and German and also ancient Latin, but that kind of doesn't count. And then as part of my Japanese degree, I did do two years of Korean, which did not really leave me with a very strong level of Korean. And I think Korean, I don't know, I don't think it's ever going to happen for me. I think that I've got, I think that now I get too frustrated if I'm trying to learn a new language from scratch because I just want to be able to speak it. Like it just, I get irritated. I mean, maybe that's just a problem with me. Maybe I need to like, (laughs) I don't know. Maybe I could still learn a new language. Um, I've bought some, um, I've got some Russian textbooks on my bookshelf. Um, But I don't know. I mean, really what I would like to do is revive my French and my German because there was a time when I was pretty good. Well, not pretty good. Pretty good for a 16-year-old at French and German. Um, And when I go to France, I have a lot of fun trying to speak French to people. Um, And so I would love to, like, I don't know, some. I I, I want to somehow incorporate those languages into my life. Like, I should find some French movies and German movies to watch, I think. (laughs) And I I guess, like, now looking forward for your YouTube channel, it's been... A long time that you put into your YouTube over 10 years now yeah. so is, is has there been kind of like a moving goalpost for your channel as well and is there kind of a new goal you have set out now I don't know really I mean for me YouTube has always been kind of like a hobby like I've never really been you know that fussed about numbers and like goalposts and milestones and things like that but I, it was exciting recently I hit 100,000 subscribers and actually today I got my channel verified so I've got a little tick next to my username now oh nice which is exciting um I don't know I just want to I want to be able to keep it up I don't want to have any like long gaps again because I'm pretty guilty for just like disappearing off the face of the earth when I get too busy so I think my current goal is just to like while I'm doing my master's still maybe upload at least a video a month and just see if I can keep it up because it is fun and um and yeah and I like it I like making YouTube videos and I don't want to just let it slip off the edge of my busy life have you ever been recognized in public (laughs) a little bit I mean mostly in Japan I have been I was trying to get into a nightclub in, in Tokyo and the bouncer was like looking at my ID and like looked at me really strangely and I was like oh no there's something wrong with my ID and he was like YouTuber and I was like oh mm. yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm here at the nightclub <laughs> um, and then in the UK it's only ever in like Japanese studies kind of circles that I get recognized but like it's I'm nowhere near like I'm not like getting stopped on the street or anything like no way <laughs> um <laughs> But, but it means that like I, I don't know how to react because like I don't you know like I feel like I can't react in like the way that I think celebrities react when they get recognized because I don't want people to think that I think I'm a celebrity because I don't like so usually I'm just like oh that's nice oh thank you for watching hi like I don't like and then and then they can tell that I'm uncomfortable and then it's always just like a really awkward situation so I never quite know <laughs> how to react appropriately in those situations <laughs> <laughs> I see and I, I guess like now even going towards you've, you've spent so long with the Japanese language going through so many different experiences kind of closing out here do you have any advice to maybe anyone out here listening to the podcast who are maybe either starting Japanese or kind of in the middle of their Japanese journey um I think I would say don't take it too seriously like keep having fun I think learn Japanese in a way that's fun for you find a hobby that you can do in Japanese like don't you know force yourself to sit there doing kanji flashcards all day I mean maybe actually then you would actually be good at kanji whereas I'm not because I didn't do that but yeah I don't know just have fun with it and talk to people talk to other learners make friends on Twitter make like yeah use Twitter that's my that's my number one advice I feel like I learned most of my Japanese off Twitter um because on Twitter, you can just say whatever you want, really, can't you? So if you've that day learned how to say, mm-hmm. I am eating bread, then you can just say that on Twitter. And it doesn't matter if it's real or not, 
but you can just like put that out in the world that you've learned this sentence and then people can respond being like oh was it nice and then you know you're having a conversation in japanese <laughs> so yeah join twitter is my advice yeah i mean that's 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 we get always get really unique advice on the podcast and that's been that's a new one right there. that's really <laughs> cool i actually never thought about that oh, before really? like using twitter that like in terms of that that's guys you make sure to go use twitter <laughs> and make sure to follow both hannah and us on yeah. twitter too while you're at it <laughs> also like you can... super random but oh i don't know you know like charlotte and japan uh just yeah. now when you were saying that i remember that she, i think one of her super old videos is a video of her just eating bread and then it got super <laughs> viral for, for like oh no God. reason <laughs> she just it's like strange the, thing, Japanese, the things that like, go I'm viral <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah next episode korekara eating bread you got it <laughs> yeah, do you like a bread bread asmr mukbang kind of asmr <laughs> <laughs> hey comment below if you guys want a bread asmr <laughs> maybe hannah can come back and help us out yeah <laughs> 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 but yeah i think um this is a good place to end the podcast here hannah thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate you, you coming here and yeah it was great talking to you and le we learned so much um guys thank please you. make sure to go check out hannah's channel she has so much coming up with her masters in oxford be <laughs> sure to check out her upcoming videos follow her on twitter we are very grateful to have her on here today thank you so much guys it was so much fun <laughs> Yeah, and like one thing we always like to do at the end, we have this little fun message we have for the Korekara listeners. So we kind of ask our guests like if they have anything to say. It could be absolutely anything. So Hannah, what is your message today to the Korekara listeners? Uh, keep an eye out for stripy snakes when you're swimming. <laughs> you heard it here first guys make sure you guys don't go swimming and get bitten by sea snakes <laughs> hey guys thanks for making it to the end of the podcast really enjoyed talking to hannah and we really appreciate the time that she took out to come talk to us if you like the podcast please let us know in the comments below and if you get a chance please consider also subscribing to us on patreon on patreon you can get early access to all the episodes and also exclusive content and we really just want to improve the quality of our podcast with better microphones and even adding video in the future so your contribution will definitely help us make better content anyways thanks to you guys for listening peace